<laughs> on our Sunday school lesson in the Sunday morning hour, uh, we've been doing we've been doing a little bit of a study on the home, uh, just to uh, and just. Uh, and again, it's not going to be a, as much in depth, uh, just, just basic things, I believe, to help our homes. Uh, that's why uh, I, uh, when the, for the children, they have the Sunday school. And I like to, for the couples and for those that uh, uh, there's some singles uh, in, that come in the Sunday school hour as well, what to kind of help to uh, establish a good home. I believe in America, one of the problems we have right now with this whole uh, transgender issue is we don't have strong homes. We don't have... Uh, moms and dads that are that there's divorces is crazy out the window even in America's churches uh, so I believe that building a home is essential uh, to to a, a great church and to a great nation we see here this is our launching verse Psalms 127 verse number one except the Lord build the house they labor in vain that build it except the Lord keep the city the watchman waketh but in vain so we've got to have God we've got to have the Lord in our homes if we don't get a hold of God then we're in trouble. Amen. If we don't get a hold of God for our lives, for our homes, for our children, then all that we do, the Bible says, is in vain. The watchman waketh, but in vain. So every morning that you get up, if you don't have God, then you, you, your whole day's wasted. Amen. Every, every day you spend with your family, if you don't send it around the Lord, you've wasted it. Every day you get up with your wife and you tell her you love her and you tell her you love her or she tells you that she loves you. If you're not doing it for the Lord, if you're not involving God, then it's all in vain. It's empty. It means nothing. It's not going to produce anything. The world is trying to make marriages work and that's why divorce is out the window because they're not getting God involved. Amen. We've got to have the Lord. And so we've got to have that desire and in that we're going to study today. Uh, we're going to go to Titus chapter 2. We're going to start there, Titus chapter 2, there we are. Titus chapter 2, verse number 1, we're going to read verses 1 through 5, these, deal, uh, these verses are going to deal a little bit with the home, so you can write these down, uh, if you're taking notes, Titus chapter 2, uh, verse 1 through 5, we're going to notice two different things here in Titus chapter 2, and then in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to go there next, but we're going to start here in Titus chapter 2, the Bible says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine, that the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior, as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. So this is Paul telling Titus what to teach and what is sound doctrine. He tells him what to tell the men, what to tell the women. But we see uh, and the thing we're going to point out here is that the, it says the aged women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands. Now, Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to read from verse 25 specifically. Ephesians chapter 5. This is a marriage chapter. It deals with the roles of marriage. It deals with the husband and the wife and, and the responses in marriage. But husband, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, we see another command here. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. I think one of the biggest problems in a home that we face, and again, some, some of these you may already practice, but the biggest problem in a home uh, that we have is that we do not understand as husbands and wives how we're commanded to love each other. We're commanded to love each other. Here we see the aged women are supposed to teach the young women what? To love their husbands. Notice you have to be taught. Sometimes, you know, we think of love as uh, uh, the, the Cinderella fairy tale where we love at first sight and everything just goes and just falls into place and, and uh, we live happily ever after. Well, love is, love is it's something you teach. It's a decision. It's, it comes naturally, yes, but it's also a decision that you make every day. In Ephesians 5.25, God commands, Husbands, love your wives. This is why it's so funny because uh, sometimes uh, if, if, when I go out, I'm door knocking and things like that. People will say, well, I just don't feel like I, I love my wife anymore. I say, well, it doesn't matter. God says you have to. <laughs> God commands you, love your wife. You can't get to the point where you say, well, I just don't feel like I love her anymore. Well, then that's not biblical love. For the women, it's the same thing. God says to teach the women to love their husbands. You can't get to a point one day and say, well, I just don't love him anymore. Well, that's not biblical love. God says, love him. God says to the men, 
Love your wives, whether you like it or not, amen? Love your wife. Why? And then look at the, our example, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So we're going to talk a little bit about how we are to love each other and the difference between it. Um, we're each commanded as a husband and a wife to love each other differently. It's a different love. For instance, when you study and you look through the... Uh, uh, so when you're studying these two verses... The word love here refers to do two different things. In chapter in Ephesians 5, verse 25, the word love comes from uh, a Greek word called agape, and many of you are familiar with it. But you look up the definition for this word love here, uh, and what it's talking about is a deep abiding love, an affectionate love. Uh, it's a, it, it's a, a love that is uh, showed by expression, and it's not a, uh, a touchy-feely love. It's a love that makes somebody feel unconditionally loved. That's the love that Christ has for us. Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. He loved, him, he loved us so much. He loved us beyond our faults. He loved us beyond our failures. And he gave himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So this is the love that God has for us. It's an unconditional love. That's the love that a husband is commanded to love his wife. An unconditional love that beyond faults, beyond fit, it's a, a deep abiding love above all else. When we go to Titus chapter 2, you look up the definition of the word love there, and it's the same, it's the same idea, but it's a different love that's more of a, a love that's given by uh, expression of, uh, like a, uh, for lack of a better term, it's almost like a flirty love. They call it, in the Bible, this Greek word here comes from phileo, for this love in Titus, Titus chapter 2. So God says for the, uh, the aged women to teach the younger women to love their husbands with a touchy-feely phileo love, is what we call that. And then the husbands are commanded to love their wives with a deep, abiding, unconditional love. Now, I'm setting all this up. I help us understand a little bit about it. We are each commanded by God to give a love uh, or to supplement the love that we normally possess. In other words, a wife, when, when a husband and a, and a wife get married, and this is, and again, this is something I've been taught and I've come to learn, and only, I've only been married two years, but you learn quick. <laughs> a wife naturally loves her husband with this deep abiding love that a husband's told to love his wife with. So God gives a command. Husbands, love your wife with an agape love. It's a Greek word, an agape love. A deep, abiding, unconditional love. Then God tells us in Titus chapter 2 that the, that the aged women are to teach the younger women to love their husbands with a touchy, huggy, expressionate feeling of love. A phileo love. It's a different love. It's love, but it's shown in different ways. Now, we each already uh, love each other, or we already have a love for each other. And for instance, the wife already loves their husband with this deep abiding love. A wife, when, when women love some, something, it is that agape love. That's naturally what women do. They just, I mean, they give everything. Women just, they fall head over heels, as we call it. Men, we naturally love our wives with this phileo love. We naturally uh, give gestures of affection, and we, uh, the, it's like a, it's a kissy love. It's a flirty love. Men are, we, that's what we naturally do. We're naturally uh, loving our wives with this flirty kind of love, is what we call it, to, to each other. But the difference is, God commands you to love your wife with the love that is harder for you to show. It's harder for a man. In other words, a man has to convince his wife that he loves her beyond just a kiss in the morning. A wife wants security. A woman wants to know that she has security. That's what a woman is attracted by. That's that agape love, an unconditional love. They want, a lady wants to know that I am loved beyond everybody else. That's why uh, a lot of times when divorces happen, normally what happens is a man it, cheats on a wife. Because women naturally, that's why we see for children, and I've seen this uh, many times on a bus route. Many times it's the dad that leaves the home. The lady is stuck with the children. Because women have a natural motherly love. 
That's a deep abiding love for their family. Men do not naturally express that, and we have to work at that. We have to work at that deep abiding love where we give all of ourselves to the spouse that God gave us. Likewise, on the other end, a lady naturally has a deep abiding love, but men but she's commanded to show it differently. So, for instance, the man already possesses this affectionate, flirty love, this phileo love, but he has to learn how to express his affection beyond just saying, I love you. To a lady, just to say, I love you, doesn't mean as much as unless you walk the walk that you talk. That's how a lady wants. They want to know, sure, you say you love me, now prove it. They want that security. Prove you love me. Don't just say you love me. Prove it. A man is different because a lady feels that every meal cooked and every floor vacuumed and every load of laundry and all that she does, that shows my love. I've been with you how long? And if I'm still here, you ought to know I love you. But a man, when we think of love, we want to know, we want to see affection. Hey, when I walked in the door, I want to kiss. I know that's what I do with my wife. I come, you know, when we have, I have my lunch hour when I'm working here at the church. When I go home, boy, I get a kiss, amen. And uh, yes, the house is clean. Yes, lunch is on the table. Yes, all of this stuff, you know, and it's all great. But hey, I want that woman. I want a kiss, amen. And, uh, you know, now my wife and I, and uh, she'll have everything clean because she wants me to see, and she tells me she wants me to see that she takes care of the home because she loves me. And I do see that. But if, if a lady never shows affection, then we feel, as men, hey, we feel neglected, you know, you know, show me affection. To a lady, it's not always about affection. You can kiss me all you want to, but uh, my wife has a sign on, and I, this is so funny, it says, all your, uh, all your, uh, oh, come on, all your, uh, all your good heart and all your well wishes cannot replace your help with the dishes or something like that is what it says. <laughs> and uh, see, it's that, it's that different mindset. A lady wants love to be proven, not just said. A man, we know our wives love us. We see what our wives do. But for us, we want that love that's expressed, that kissing love, that affectionate love. And so, again, these are the two different types of love. A lot of times what happens is we want the love that we give. What we forget is in a marriage, we're commanded to give not what we want or need, but what our mate wants and needs. In a marriage, you've covenanted yourself to God and to your mate to give what they need. 1 Corinthians 7.4. 1 Corinthians 7.4. We'll draw a conclusion here. In just a moment. First Corinthians 7 4. The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time, that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your inconsistency or incontinency, I'm sorry. So we see here that God says the wife does not have power of herself and the husband does not have power of himself because in a marriage, you're commanded to meet each other's needs. You're commanded to think of her, not yourself. She's commanded to think of you, not herself. And then God says, don't defraud one another. In other words, don't hold back from another your love for each other. Don't uh, be afraid to show each other that you love each other. Amen. Don't be afraid out in public to reach over and give each other a kiss. and be, don't, don't hold back from each other your love and, and expressing that love. God says because you have to meet each other's needs. What are the needs that are needed for a wife? She needs that deep abiding love. Men, it is our job to provide security in our marriage by proving, not just getting up in the morning and saying, I love you, but proving by our daily life that we love her. That's what Christ did. God said, I love you. So what did he do? He gave his son to die. We love him because he first loved us. That's how a wife is. She loves you because you proved you love her. Now, she knows you loved her when she married her, but your love increases and her love and a lady's love for her husband increases the more that she sees 
and, and the more that a husband proves that love. That gives a wife security. Um, uh, for a lady, uh, or for a man, ladies, it is a lady's job, God says, for the aged women to teach the younger women to show their affection to their husband. To show, so in other words, when a man comes home, kiss him. When you're out in public, show that love. Be flirty with each other. You know, it's, it's funny how when, you, you know, when we're dating, you know, uh, you know, we have that, you know, you flirt when you're dating. I'm not going to talk about my dating experience. <laughs> but, uh, you, know, we, uh, you, know, we, you know, you flirt. You say little things, you know, and, you, you know, and things like that. Of course, my wife and I, you know, we didn't touch before marriage, anything like that. We didn't cross a boundary. But you have that flirting, you know. And for a man, that, that, that's what a man, you know, we, we look for that. We, we, we like that. Now, I, now <laughs> be careful, amen. Uh, we won't get into that end. But between a husband and a wife, but there are some that are flirty, that shouldn't that should not be amen but remain with each other but don't be afraid to flirt with your husband in other words don't be afraid to show affection to your husband because that's what a man wants a man needs to see we work men are men are on sight men we 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 see ladies want to feel we they want security men want to see sight i can see the i can see the house is clean but I didn't get a hug. I didn't get a kiss. Those kinds of things. We're commanded to meet those needs. In a home, in the average home, what happens is we get confused. We want the love that, or we want to give the love that we have. In other words, for a lady, they want to give a deep abiding love that they normally have. A man wants to give a touchy-feely love that he wants. And then there's confusion because the lady says, well, you're going to have to love me beyond just a touchy-feely love. And a man says, well, you're going to have to love me beyond just doing the dishes. And then that's where we run into some hardships because, again, you're commanded to meet each other's needs. You're commanded to love your wife with that as a man. You're commanded to love her with that deep abiding love. Prove that love to her. A lady's commanded to show her love to her husband. Be affectionate. Give a hug. Give a kiss. Show, a, write a note. Tell him how handsome he is. Tell him how strong you think he, all of those, whatever that you do, those pet names that you have, all of that for a wife to that husband is what your mate needs. And then what you'll find is when you give your mate what she needs or what he needs, then you'll get the love that you need in return. When you focus on the need of your spouse, as a man, if we focus on giving our wife security and loving her with that deep abiding love, proving it every day, doing, uh, thinking of her, even the little gestures of flowers and chocolate, all of those things, that helps what you'll find is the lady will respond with the love that you need. And if a lady will focus on giving affection, a kissy, flirty, hugging love of affection to her husband, then a husband will respond with a deep abiding love. You'll get what you need, not by focusing on yourself, but by focusing on your spouse. Again, this is the love, uh, the love that uh, God shows to us. God loves us. And so by loving, he gave. Ultimately, love is considering one another, not considering ourselves. We learn that from, that's why God says, Ephesians 5, 25, that we're even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. When your love becomes selfish, it's no longer love. It's lust. So when you begin to be more focused on yourself and what you need, and you say, well, my spouse is not meeting my needs, then you've got the wrong mindset. You're to meet your spouse's needs, not your own. You're not to focus on, well, she's not meeting mine. You're to focus on meeting her. The wife is not to say, well, he's not meeting my needs. You're not to focus on that. You're to focus on meeting his as a husband and wife. Because, again, that love is not a selfish love. It's a love that is for each other. It's a love that is willing, like Christ, to give, not to take. 
This is where the world gets wrong. The world thinks that you love each other and they flirt and do all of these things and get themselves in trouble and never commit to marriage. And then when they do get married, it ends up in divorce. Why? Because they're not worried about their spouse. They just wanted to fulfill their lust. Once their lust is fulfilled, what more, what more is there in their marriage? And so, and so they leave and go to the next person. But you'll find when you focus on your spouse and meeting her needs or a wife meeting his need, that's a never-ending process. That's every day. That's how marriages stay together for years to come. Why? Because you're focused on giving them every day what they need. And it's an everyday process. Ladies have to be every day. It's like for a man, I, I, I uh, picture it as a bank account. You have to build a bank account of love because you're going to make quite a few withdrawals. <laughs> you're going to have to prove to your wife you love her every day because then when you mess up, she's got to have something to pull from. And if you have a non-sufficient fund charge, you're in trouble. <laughs> you're in big trouble. For a wife, it's the same thing. A wife builds a bank account of love with her husband by every day giving that affectionate love, showing her expression of love, not just in what she does, but showing it to her husband every day. Doing that, again, provides security as well for the man, knowing my wife loves me. If we neglect to meet each other's needs, then what God shows us, and God shows us that a marriage begins to become, uh, we begin to get divided. We begin to get aggravated. We begin to very easily uh, become where, uh, as the Bible says, we're uh, given to anger because we're trying to, we're trying to get what God naturally wants. God made a man and a woman to be married. God made us to be together, and we're trying to fulfill a need. But when we're focused too much on ourselves, then we, and then that's where we meet into problems. Now, very quickly, okay. Um, last here, determined to see God's commands as our focused goal in marriage. God gives us commands about uh, about our marriage, and we're we're to determine to f that that those goals that God or those commands that God gives us to be our goals. First Corinthians seven thirty two to thirty five says, "But I would have you without carefulness." He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. There is difference also between a wife and a virgin. The unmarried woman careth for the things of the Lord, that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she that is married careth for the things of the world, how she may please her husband. And this I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord without distraction. So again... The first goal in a marriage ought to be to please your spouse. That's what your goal ought to be. When you said, I do, it's not to please yourself. Focus on how you can please your spouse. And remember this, not, your, your wife is different from your mother. Your wife is different from every other lady. You have to focus on what pleases her. I have to focus on what pleases my wife. That was something I had to learn. Hey, man, my uh, parents, uh, and, I, and then when I got married, uh, my wife is different. I just thought all women are the same, chocolate and roses. It just, boom, you know. But she likes a certain kind of rose. Amen. Oh, she likes a certain kind of chocolate. Oh, see, my mom likes something. I used to buy my mom gifts, you know. I was taught, buy your mom gifts. Well, my mom does, or my wife does not like the same as my mother. So I have to focus on what pleases her. Your job as a husband is not to find out what pleases every, every other woman. It's to find out what pleases the woman God gave you. What does she like? What does she care for? Be interested in her to find ways to prove you love her. A wife the same. What pleases your husband? What is it that he enjoys? Find that and exploit that. Find it and use that and please each other. Focus on helping each other. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. Focus on marriage as each other and then remember uh, that marriage is honorable. We focus on each other, but also remember 
that marriage is honorable. God says marriage is honorable in all. So in other words, there's nothing between a husband and wife that as far as to show your love for each other, God says it's honorable. Enjoy it. Don't let the world make you feel like, well, you can't show your love to each other in public. Or don't let the world make you feel inferior because you've been married for 25 years and you uh, are not divorced yet. The world, makes you think, the world sometimes makes you feel inferior because they think, well, you've, uh, you've only been with one woman your entire life. The world makes you think, well, that's, you know, they, 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 make, they make a Christian feel inferior because you stay married to one woman because you love her beyond all her faults. They make you feel inferior because you love your children. They make you feel inferior because you're not willing to divorce when maybe problems come. But you remember that marriage is honorable. In this society, now transgender marriage is becoming the trend. My friend, it is time for Christians that are married that we stand up and we talk and we show that our marriage is honorable in the sight of God. Transgender marriage is not honorable because it's not marriage. But when you married that woman and God gave you her for life, that was honorable. You did an honorable thing. In the sight of God, God is pleased. Now focus on keeping that honorable marriage together. Focus on keeping that honorable marriage from, or keep it lasting. Don't, like he says here, the rest of the verse, Hebrews 13, but whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. Let's focus on keeping an honorable marriage. Boy, it's a blessing to be married. Now, Matthew 19, 4, 6. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife? And they twain shall be one flesh. Wherefore they are no more twain, but one flesh. What Therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. The last goal uh, in, this, in this lesson here is to focus on being one flesh. Focus on not only pleasing each other, enjoying an honorable marriage, but focus on being one flesh. In other words, marriage is not just something you did one time and that you just don't work at the rest of your life. It's a consistent thing. Being one flesh, being of one mind, being an agreement. You have to work at, a, in, at it every day agreeing with your wife, keeping each other in check, uh, and, and focus on being that one flesh for a lifetime. Now, you're a one flesh in the sight of God, but sometimes you may be one flesh in the sight of God, but you may be double-minded in a marriage. Focus on being that one flesh that God has for us. And then lastly, um, as we read there in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, a principle that you can put into practice in your marriage. God tells us we ought to show that we love each other and we ought not to defraud each other. But uh, verse number five, defraud ye not one another except, so there's one exception to where God says you don't show each other your love. Look what it was. Except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again. So God gives a principle in your marriage, whether it's once a year, whether it's, Whenever, whatever it, you decide. But God says when you, the only time you stop showing each other love is this one time where you come together and you agree that for a small period of time you give yourself to nothing but fasting and prayer. This is a time where you separate from showing each other your love and you focus on the Lord. Because again, you've got to have God in your marriage. So there should be a time in our marriages where you together agree, we will not show each other love. We will focus on fasting and prayer for a time, whether it be just for a day, whether it be for a week, whatever it may be. But God says you agree. Why is that? Because number one, our marriage is to be focused on the Lord. Your marriage is to be focused on God. If it doesn't have God involved, that's why you fast and pray. Get God involved in your marriage. Number two, because, here's a question for you, and this is something I thought of this last week, and this is another a reason for this. When you, in a marriage, as it goes on, you'll find faults. We get older. 
Does your love for your wife or love for your husband only last as long as she does? Or as last as long as he does? In other words, would you love your wife if she uh, were tomorrow an invalid? Would you as a wife love your husband if tomorrow he was put in a hospital or in a hospice care? And no longer could show you that love that maybe that you would need. Because, see, this fasting and prayer determines how much you love your husband by willing to say, I love you. I don't always have to have that love because my, my love for you is because God said to love you. A lot of times, and, this, and, and again, for a marriage, we'll only love if we're given love. A lot of people think, well, once I've heard of this, where when the wife maybe is put in the hospice or put in the nursing home, well, then they get divorced and go get married to somebody else. They don't take care of their spouse. My friend, that's not love. When God said, when God said let not man put asunder, God meant it. There's no reason. But that's because your love has to go beyond your spouse and what she can give to her. Your love goes because of the Lord and it goes to her unconditionally. And that's what this time of fasting and prayer is. It proves that you don't have to have the love that your spouse gives you. You'll love her no matter what, or you'll love him no matter what. And then it proves to the Lord that you love God more than you love your spouse. Because anybody can go to church with their spouse. But it doesn't mean that you love God while you're here. Anybody can say, well, I'll go to church with him because that's what he wants to do. But as soon as he's gone, I'm not going to church again. Or the, sometimes the husband the same way. They go to church because their wife wants to go to church. That doesn't mean that you love God. So that time of fasting and prayer also shows to God, say, God, I know that you've given me a wife to love, but my love is to you first. And so there should be a time, again, it's up to you, that you take a day, a week, whatever it is, that you separate for a time. doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go different places because you have children. But it just means that you agree together not to show each other love and to focus on fasting and prayer. Fasting from each other. Praying. Asking God to get involved in your marriage. Now, for those of you that aren't married, what does this teach you? It teaches you to remember... That just because somebody tells you they love you does not mean they love you. So for those in the room, you're not married. Just because some fellow with slick hair that looks like Justin Bieber, just because some guy in a pair of britches walks up and says, hey, love you, doesn't mean you believe it. Because that will not satisfy God made a man to fulfill a wife to help her to know she's loved unconditionally. Amen. Also, it reminds you that marriage is a beautiful picture of the love of God and the love that Christ has for the church. And that's why it's honorable. Marriage is honorable because it is a picture of the love that Christ has to the church, that he loves us unconditionally. It ought to make us love God more to know how much that God loves us being willing to give His Son. And then it also ought to make you love your spouse more to know that God has made your marriage a picture of His love for the church. That's why God hates divorce, because God would never separate Himself from you. When you got saved, that was for eternity. God will never separate Himself from you. So to divorce in the sight of God is, is unthinkable because God would never do that to us. And so God asks that we never do it to each other. Love your spouse. Focus on giving each other the love that is needed. And what you'll find is you'll have a more fulfilling relationship and you'll have a longer marriage. Amen. In this world, again, it's all about self. It's all about lust. Don't let the devil get in your home and make you think it's all about me. Have God's love where it's all about each other. How can you please your spouse? Amen.
All right, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you. Thank you for the wonderful study that you've given to us, Lord, about uh, loving each other, Lord, and what a blessing that it is, Lord, to be married, Lord, how it's, uh, Lord, it's honorable, Lord, and thank you so much for, Lord, the opportunity, Lord, that uh, you gave to me, Lord, and bringing a beautiful lady my way, Lord. I love her very dearly. Lord, I pray that each and every one of us would focus, Lord, on making our marriages, Lord, uh, honorable and making them, Lord, pleasing in your sight. Lord, that's what we've got to have. We've got to have couples and marriages in our churches, Lord, that are strong, that love each other, Lord, that are focused on serving God. And Lord, when we have homes that, Lord, are sound and secure and founded in the Word of God, then, Lord, we'll have a strong church and we'll have a strong nation. May you please, Holy Spirit, not let the devil to have his way, not let the devil come into these homes and into these lives and separate, Lord, and, and cause division and cause problems. Dear God, we've got to have you in a special way in our homes. May we focus on you building the house, God. May it not be in vain for our children's sake, Lord. For those that, Lord, uh, Lord, the children that we have in our homes, may we, Lord, focus on, Lord, helping them to see Christ's love through our love for each other, Lord. What a blessing that it is. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life. Pray that you bless the next hour to come. Bless the message. Bless, Lord, those that are still coming, Lord, for church this morning. May you speak to our hearts. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.